Good morning. morning. Welcome to King of Kings on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. There is a thought that is common to us all. And you might think that you're different, but it's part of every single one of us, so much so that theologians have given it a name. They call it the opinio legis. That's Latin for the idea that we have to do something to forge a relationship with our God. We have to do something. We have to participate. And if we're not there with a relationship with God, if we don't feel that peace, well, then we just need to try harder. We need to be more sincere and more dedicated. We need to get the right spiritual advice or that one piece of insight that we need to put everything together. But today, Jesus comes to us in the readings, and he crushes. He crushes with the law the sinfulness, the arrogance and pride that prompts that feeling. But thankfully, he also comforts us and soothes us with the gospel that turns us to him in repentance to provide what only he can provide, forgiveness, life, and salvation. That's the thought of our worship today. We'll begin with the first hymn posted, Lord, tis not that I did choose you. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love him and serve him as his dear children, but we've disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, 
I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. And now in the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, keep your household, the church, in continual godliness and set us free from all adversities that, under your protection, we may serve you with true devotion and holy deeds through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> You may be seated. The first lesson for this morning is recorded in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 12 through 22. In Moses' farewell address, he reminds the Israelites that they were always dependent on God, and they always would be as well. So now, Israel... What is the Lord your God asking of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes that I am commanding you today for your own good. Indeed, the heavens and the heaven of heavens, the earth and everything that is on it, these belong to the Lord your God. Still the Lord attached himself to your fathers, loved them, and he chose their descendants after them, that's you, from all peoples, as it is today. So cut away the tough shell of your sinful nature, and do not be stubborn any longer. The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty one, and the awesome one, who does not show favoritism and does not take a bribe. He carries out justice for the fatherless and widows. He loves the alien who dwells within you and gives him food and clothing. So you are to fear, I love the alien because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Fear the Lord your God, serve him, cling to him, and take your oaths in his name. He is your glory. He is your God who performed for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. When your fathers went down to Egypt, they numbered 70 people. But now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of the sky. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 90, written on the bottom of page 5 of your worship folder. We'll read the psalm responsibly as written. Lord, you have been our dwelling place before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world. You turn people back to dust. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. 
Teach us to number our days. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The second le lesson is from John's first epistle, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. John encourages us to put our love and trust in God, not the things of this world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, boasting about material possessions, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Alleluia. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel for today and also our sermon text is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. Jesus reminds us that trying to find a relationship with God on our own is impossible, but with him, it's not only possible, it's certain. A certain rich ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. I have kept all these since I was a child, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the ruler heard these words, he became very sad because he was very rich. When Jesus saw that the man became very sad, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for people is possible for God. And Peter said, Look, we have our, left our possessions and followed you. He said to them, Amen, I tell you, anyone who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will most certainly receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We'll join together in hymn 717, What is the World to Me?
Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, before COVID, life as a pastor was pretty familiar to me. I've been doing it 25 years or so, so life was kind of as I expected it to be. I prepared a sermon. I wrote a worship service. I prepared Bible class for the week. I went to visit some sick and shut-ins to give them communion, maybe visited people in the hospital, all things that I had done for a quarter of a century. But then COVID hit. And I always like to say that made us all as pastors and a little bit of an audio engineer and a video producer because all of a sudden we had to take what we did on Sunday morning and reproduce that so that people could go to church online. Just one problem with that, there is no class at the seminary for video production or becoming an audio engineer. So I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And we didn't really have someone in the congregation with those skills, so if it was going to happen, I had to figure it out on my own. Well, sort of. It's a little joke going around in the office. If you don't know what you're doing, go to YouTube. They'll help. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I did. I went to YouTube, and I searched for the easiest way to record worship service and put it online. And it had a number of suggestions. The problem was we didn't have all the equipment and software we needed, so I went back to YouTube and I searched for the top five softwares for producing worship. And then we needed a faster modem, so I looked for the 10 best, fastest modems. I looked for the best audio interface. And there were videos there going one after one after one of the products. And they would list the top 10 or the top five, and they would tell you this one's best because it's the most user-friendly, or this one is best because it's easiest on the budget. But what I really was interested in is not the top five or the top 10. What do you think I really wanted to know? What's at the top of the list? What's at the top of the list? That's a question that Jesus wants us all to be asking today, not just, not of other people, but of ourselves, and not about audio interfaces or computer software or modems. No, he wants us to ask, what's the top of the list of my priorities? That's the question he confronted this man with in our text today. What's at the top of your list? We really don't know a whole lot about him. We know that he was part of the crowd listening to Jesus teach in Judea. Inadvertently, I added when I read the reading that he was the rich ruler. Well, one of the Gospels tells us that he is in fact rich. One of the other Gospel writers adds the fact that he was a young ruler, but we don't know exactly what he ruled or how young he was. And Luke tells us that he was wealthy. In fact, it's not just Luke, but all of the gospel writers tell us he's wealthy. We don't know where it came from. Maybe he just inherited daddy's money. Or maybe business was so good, the climate was so good, he couldn't help but become successful at a very young age. Or maybe he got where he was by dishonesty. We don't know where he got his wealth from. We just know that he had it. And as Jesus was about to leave, he came out of the crowd and he came up to Jesus and asked this question. He said, good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And don't get the impression that this was just a casual inquiry of the Savior. 
Because Mark tells us he ran up to Jesus and he dropped to his knees to ask that question. From the time he had been a little child, he'd been dedicating himself to following God's commandments. But I suspect after listening to Jesus preach, he maybe figured, am I missing something? Does Jesus have answers that I don't have? Is he asking questions I've never asked? Does he have one piece of vital information that I'm missing so that I can make sure I have my place in paradise? And so he asked Jesus that question. But Jesus is an amazing teacher. <laughs> Instead of answering the question, he asks a different one. Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. In other words, God's the only one perfect enough, holy enough to stake out a claim in heaven. <coughs> and yet that does not stop us from thinking that we can get there ourselves. It's part of every single one of us. We have this in our head that we have the capacity inside of us to be good, God kind of good, if we can only find a way to unlock it and to unleash it. In fact, there are entire religions and church bodies based on that very notion that man has the capacity to be good enough for God. Well, instead of telling this man that he was fooling himself, Jesus let him to discover that on his own. Jesus reads a list, doesn't he? You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And what was his answer? All these things I have kept since I was a child. Don't get me wrong, I don't think this man realized or thought that he was perfect, even in his own mind. What he was doing there is exactly what sinful people seek to do when it comes to God's perfect holy law. Chip it away. Whittle it down. Find a way to reduce it so much that I can, in my own mind, think that I've actually kept it. You see, what he was saying is, I've never taken anyone's life. I've never had an adulterous affair. I've never committed perjury in a court of law, but don't for a minute think that that means that we've kept God's law. Just because you've never taken someone's life doesn't mean that you haven't said hateful and hurtful things about that annoying neighbor living next door. Just because you haven't invited another woman into your bed doesn't mean that you've always maintained eye contact as that beautiful woman walked down the sidewalk. Don't think that just because your lies were, oh, they're just little ones. Just little half-truths given to people who really don't matter in the grand scheme of things about minor insignificant things, don't think for a moment that that means that you have kept the Eighth Commandment. If you've done even those little things, you have shattered God's law. Looking at God's law, like, if I only keep the big things, then that's good enough. That's kind of like looking at an iceberg and trying to judge its size based on what's above the surface of the water. And this man was about to have his world rocked. Not just because he didn't also do the little things of the law, but something bigger than that. The reason he didn't do those little things of the law or keep the full law is because God wasn't as high on his list as he needed to be, and that is number one. And I think it's important for us to come to grips, first of all, with why Jesus did that. Why did he blow up his bubble of self-confidence? Why did he knock him 
down to the ground. It was out of love. Because he didn't want this man to deceive himself all the way to hell. So in an instant, Jesus puts his finger directly on the problem. In an instant, Jesus identifies exactly what this man had as first on his list. The one thing he couldn't do without, Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come. Follow me. In one, three short sentences, I should say, Three short sentences. Jesus perfectly applies both tables of the law. The fact is you don't have your love for your fellow man in the right spot on the list because you have supplanted his place with yourself. And the truth is, God's not first on your list either. You are. And the rich young ruler knew what that meant. When the ruler heard these words, he became very sad because he was very rich. It wasn't his wealth that made him sad. It was the fact for the first time someone had revealed that he had his wealth in God's place. He loved God. There's no doubt about it. He appreciated God's commands. He dedicated himself to keeping those things. He wanted desperately to be in heaven. But the one thing he was unwilling to do was to sacrifice his wealth to honor God and to serve people. Jesus says it. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. I don't want you to misunderstand those words because Jesus isn't talking so much about wealth there, how much we have, but rather how much we view our wealth's worth. It's because there's this tendency inside of us to look to wealth and possessions for our security and our happiness. It just makes such good sense. But isn't that God's place? Doesn't he want to be the very thing that brings us true happiness and joy? Doesn't he want to be the one to supply us our peace and our security? And it doesn't get any easier if we've convinced ourselves that we really don't have that much wealth. Because it's just as easily easy to kick God out of his place and put doubt and anxiety there instead. The question puts everything into focus for us, doesn't it? What's the, on the top of your list? And it puts things into focus not just in regard to material wealth, but every single area of our Christian life. What's on the top of your list? Is it your desire to be free from that loveless marriage? so that you can pursue somebody else, or is it the God who says, I hate divorce, and I will not accept the dissolution of that marriage for any reason other than marital unfaithfulness or malicious desertion? What's on the top of your list? Is it the need to get the kids down to Tucson for that baseball tournament this weekend, or is it my God who says, come to my house of worship and give to me the honor and praise I deserve what's on the top of your list. Is it the desire to scratch whatever temptation itch is itching at the moment? Is it your desire to listen to your Lord who calls on you to run away from temptation willingly out of love for him? Or is it your own desire to scratch that itch? What's at the top of your list? The simple truth is the law spoken from the mouth of the Savior to this wealthy man speaks directly to us, and it leads us to that very same place, an ugly and horrible place. If entering the kingdom of God were based on what we do 
and how well we listen to God's commands and put his words into practice. We're sunk. We would be right there with the rest of the crowd saying, if what Jesus says is true, then who in all the world can be saved? Answer, no one without Jesus. But I want you to see what Jesus is doing. He's leading us to that ugly, horrible place, that realization of who and what we are by nature so that we can be totally dependent on him, so that we can realize our absolute dependence on him. Listen to what Jesus says. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's an interesting picture. And maybe one that has really a couple of different explanations. Could Jesus be talking about that desert animal with a hump on its back going through the little opening at the end of a sewing needle? Sure. Could Jesus have been talking about a smaller gate in the walls of Jerusalem that was big enough only for an individual to go through and not an invading army? I suppose. About the only way for a soldier to get through the camel's eye was to get down off of that camel, strip everything off the camel's back, and stoop down. Isn't that too the way we enter the kingdom of God? <coughs> to have all the baggage all the baggage of our sin and our failures stripped off of our backs and to stoop down and to worship a Savior. In humble repentance, stoop down and worship a Savior at the foot of the cross. A Savior who always kept God at the top of his list in every temptation. Father, number one. A Savior who kept the Father at the top of his list, even as the blood was pouring out of his veins, even as the Father turned his back on the Son, crossed him off the list, Jesus willingly hung there because he knew that that was the place where he could take that baggage off of you and put it on himself. Where he could pour out perfect, holy blood so we'd never have to carry that baggage again where he could offer a perfect sacrifice of obedience, so much so that through faith in him, God looks at you now and sees you as a perfect child of God. And through faith says, all these things, all these commandments you have kept, kept ever since you were made a child of God through holy baptism, what was impossible for you to do on your own, I have made certain in the life and the death of my son. Thank God Jesus kept God at the top of the list for us. Can you go to YouTube and search what are the priorities in life that I should have? Give me the top ten. I don't know. Can you find a list of the top five ways to have a life of peace and security, not just here, but also in the life to come? I'm not sure about that either, but I do know where you can go to find a perfect Savior. One who always kept God in his proper place, one who always kept his Father at the top of the list. It's at the cross. It's in his word. Spoken from this pulpit on the nightstand next to your bed, and it's in the sacraments too. Run there. Run there, because there in that Savior, not only do you get forgiveness and peace from all of your failures washed away, you get strength too. Strength and power. The next time you're faced with temptation, do I decide on myself? Am I number one, or is God going to be number one today? You have strength in his word and his sacraments. 
You have power and strength through the gospel. Power and strength to the gospel to always have God as your top priority, to be able to say, today I lived up to my high status as a child of God, the one he gave me by grace. Today, I made my heavenly Father smile. Run to the word, and there you have peace, and there you have power. God grant that we never lose sight of that resource. God grant that we have the insight to make that number one so that we can always make him number one as well. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that transcends all human understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. For our confession of faith this morning, we'll use the explanation of the second article. It's in the middle of page 7 of your worship folder. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did, that I should be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. We'll bring forward our offering. We demonstrate, God, your number one as we return some of the blessings you've given us. Please also take this time to sign the friendship register. It's a little red folder in your pew. And pass it down to the others in your room. Please stand for prayer. Almighty Father, we come to you at the gracious invitation of your Son, asking to receive your gifts as little children. Keep us from allowing our sinful hearts, the world, or the devil himself, from sending us away from you sad, because we were unwilling to give you first place in our lives. Through your law, lead us to despair of ourselves, to see dependence on you as our only hope, and through your gospel of forgiveness, turn us to you for help. Be merciful to your church here and in every place. Defend our pastors from arrogance and pride, and strengthen them in the faithful preaching of your word, that both your holy law and your precious gospel would be proclaimed, and your children be united in saving faith. As your son, welcome children, give us a deep care for the children entrusted to us, that we would defend their lives even before birth. Instill in parents a desire and a commitment to bring their little children to Jesus. 
Use our Lutheran schools, our Sunday school, Bible classes, catechism classes to serve them in the faith. Teach each of us in humility to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. Give the leaders of nations wisdom to govern in accordance with your will. Keep them mindful of the stewardship that they hold on behalf of others, that they may fulfill their duties with diligence and humility. You deliver our souls from death and our feet from falling, so we ask that you would care for those who are near death. Preserve them from despair. Give them a confident hope in the resurrection promises of our risen Lord. Come to the aid of everyone in need, including Christine Schlieff and her family, as you wait to make your will known about the end of her life, and Gretchen Flores as she continues to recover from infection in the hospital. O Lord, if we trust in ourselves for righteousness, we're lost and dead in our sins. Yet you mercifully draw us to yourself in repentance and hear the cries of those who trust in your Son. Grant us humility, that we may not exalt ourselves or treat our brothers and sisters with contempt. Rescue us from every evil and bring us into your kingdom as your beloved children. To you alone be all glory, O Father, together with the Holy Spirit and the Son in whose name we join and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the next hymn, hymn number 404, Jesus Grant That Balm and Heal.
Please stand for a closing prayer. <coughs> Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. May be seated for our closing hymn, hymn number 816, I Am Trusting You, Lord Jesus. Good morning, welcome to all of you again. A number of people I see have returned to us from the Midwest. Good choice, you got out just in time. <laughs> you might not be aware of the fact that over the summer we were practicing a new liturgy. We were doing that during worship, but we also 